jumping into the second installment of the Lord's Supper Bible class, the tough questions, just to kind of give you the overview. Last week we looked at the basics. Today, fellowship and other sticky topics. And three other churches, why do priests drink all the wine? And questions such as that. So, let's get started. For review, what are the five things we receive in the Lord's Supper? Body and the blood, bread and wine, the word or forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. That, those are the words of our Lord. Matthew 26, listing the five things we receive. Cup and fruit of the vine are, are the wine in there. That's why they're covered in the wine. Which of the following are true about the Lord's Supper for today? We invite everyone to communion. No. All that really matters at the Lord's Supper is my relationship with God. I've heard that. Just like the Mormons, we judge the heart of the communicant. Anytime I start with something just like the Mormons, the dead giveaway. False. If someone is insane, they should not commune. Hmm. Let's consider which of the following is what our church calls its communion practice. This is kind of similar to what we did last week with the different names for the Lord's Supper. Is it closed communion? Open communion? Close communion? Or you pick two? Yeah, it is actually one and three. You'll see those interchanged. In fact, you'll most commonly see it as that, close parentheses be communion, because it's both. That's just how it is commonly explained, and we'll get into the details shortly. First off, let's see what our God says. This is 1 Corinthians 11. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. How might you sin against the body and blood of the Lord? What do you think? What do you think? Yep, and you just jumped one logical step, but she's not wrong. It's when you do so in an unworthy manner. And what makes you unworthy? That's the question. How can you avoid coming to the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? You have to examine yourself. And if you don't, that's what makes you unworthy. Okay? None of you are worthy to stand before God, obviously. We're all sinners. You cannot stand in the presence of Holy God. But He called us to come. Jesus, sinners, does receive. Even to the Lord's Supper. Okay? And so understanding that you are a sinner, what we talked about last week when we went through page 156, that's how you examine yourself. And so if you haven't had a chance to, please do look at those again. Next, this is applied. Bob feels terrible this past week. He took out the troubles at work on his family. He yelled at his wife and kids. He doesn't know if he should go to the Lord's Supper because he doesn't feel worthy. Or two, Betty had a great week. She doesn't recall any big sins. She doesn't really think there are any sins. She doesn't care about the Bible. She's looking forward to seeing her friends and taking the Lord's Supper at church today. Will Betty or Bob commune in an unworthy manner? Which one? Betty, yeah. Both are unworthy. But Betty's going to commune in an unworthy manner. Next. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. How do we eat and drink judgment on ourselves? Yeah, if you do not acknowledge the real presence, that's what he says in 1 Corinthians 11 here. All right, what does that judgment look like? Back in Paul's day, what did it look like? Did 
Did they have spontaneous naps called narcolepsy? No, he's talking about people died because they were abusing the Lord's Supper. I have yet to see that in my 12 years. Nor have any of my colleagues pointed out that someone was abusing the sacrament and they died. Could that happen? I, I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to know the mind of my God. <clears throat> what is a far more dangerous, well, as dangerous, consequence of going to the Lord's Supper and not knowing what you're doing or what's going on? You take it to your damnation. How, Mary? That's an excellent point. If you come up and you think, I have, let's say that you're Betty from the previous slide and you don't care about anything, there's no sin, and you go to the Lord's Supper, what do you think is happening? How are you and God doing? Does Betty think? Great. Are they? No. And so she's taking the Lord's Supper to her damnation. She's even confirmed in her unbelief. Because everything that everyone's telling her is that she's great. In truth, that she's not. Next. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. Besides what is happening between the communicant and God, what else is happening at the Lord's Supper? It's not just you and God, what else? You, you and, we're all one body, yeah. We who are many are one body. We go up there. So when you come to the Lord's Supper, you are saying, I'm part of you. There's this communion, not with you and God, but everyone else up there. It's this unity of faith. That's good. That's a good thing. Paul's emphasizing that. All right? So let's diagram it out. What are the two relationships God wants to be concerned about in the Lord's Supper? See the arrows? God and? Other. All right? If someone isn't a Christian, which relationship is broken? It's got to be the one with God, yeah. It's not happening. So this is bad. This is where you can take it to your damnation, and you're only confirmed in your unbelief. All right? If someone isn't a Christian, why shouldn't we commune them? Well, Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. I'm trying to think of something more loveless than to not tell them to stay back and don't commune. Why would you want them to commune with you if they're not a Christian and they don't know anything? This is just sending a terrible message to somebody. All right? If someone is a Christian but doesn't believe the same things we do, which relationship is broken? They and God might be doing just fine. It's with the other. All right? Now, why shouldn't we commune them? This is the so what of it all. We're not all one body exactly. And why does that matter? How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. If someone is a Christian, but they are teaching something wrong about God's Word, our love for God's Word will say, hang on a second. We're not going to join together in the Lord's Supper because there's a difference here. And those differences matter because God's Word is important. That's the first thing. Second? Their teaching will spread like gangrene. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. What's the second reason? that it would be wise to not commune people who do not believe the same thing you do. You're worried about God's word. What's the other worry? About us. Yeah. You, it is naive to think that false teaching just kind of stays out and doesn't really matter. And if you send a message that it, that it doesn't really matter, you might get sucked in with that. Lastly, My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back. Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. 
So the three reasons were love for God's word, love for myself. God doesn't want me to get sucked in with gangrene or yeast, false teaching. The third one is for the other person. Point out their error. It's okay. That's good to point out someone's error. That's loving. I mean, whether it be something in your teeth or walking out with toilet paper on the shoe, we do that all the time, and that's, that's what's something that a friend does. They may not always like you for it. That's good. Let's apply. Number one, Bob is up to usher this Sunday. He sees a new visitor walking to Star of Jerusalem Lutheran Church. What it is mean Sunday? What should he do? You could do all that, or shake their hand. That's all I want my ushers to do. Shake their hand. That's it. Okay? If they ask, by all means, tell them. But if there's a new person that walks in this communion Sunday, shake their hand. Okay? Next. Number two, it's time for the Lord's Supper. Bob ushers the congregation up to the Lord's Supper one few at a time. He gets to the new visitor. The visitor stands up to go for the Lord's Supper. What should he do? Let it go. The risk of singing a Disney frozen song. Yeah. Okay? Yield to the pedestrian. That's what I want my ushers to do. Yeah. Pastor Frank sees the new visitor coming to the Lord's Supper right in line with the rest of the congregation. As he comes by with the bread, what should he do? And the one, I have to explain this. The reason why I say the bread is because, in theory, the person who passes out the bread has the authority because if I come by with the wine and they've already given the bread, we've already crossed the threshold. It's already happened. Now, I usually have someone else do the bread because, well, you'll see in a minute, maybe you can guess just from what I just said, but what should he do? Yeah, offer it. That is what I would suggest. You don't know if he's a Wells member incognito who was just being a little rude and didn't tell me. You don't know. Because all of the things that I just front-loaded with all those Bible passages might be nullified by he's so-and-so's Wells uncle who knows exactly what's going on and believes the exact same thing I do. Once in a while it doesn't work out that way. But in this case, I would still commune them. But I'm going to keep on going in this string of questions before I do whatever. Number four. Pastor Frank told Bart last week not to come to the Lord's Supper because he was caught in an unrepentant sin. This Sunday, Bart walks up to the communion rail. As Pastor Fred comes by with the bread, what should he do? Ask him by. I have yet to have that happen. None of you have been so bold to challenge me publicly on a Sunday morning. And I pray it doesn't happen. Five, Betty has a friend that she has witnessed. Her friend wants to come to church with her, but it's a communion Sunday. What would you do if you were Betty? Bring her. Shake her hand. Yeah. Come on down. Welcome. It's a great church. And I love my communion practice too. But you should talk to pastor because I get a little confused. Any of those. Or if you know what you're talking about, that's great. Six, Pastor Frank is going to visit Barry in the nursing home. Barry has advanced dementia and never knows where he is, what day it is, or who Pastor Frank is. Should Pastor Frank come in Barry? What, jumping back, don't, don't jump back, Nate. But jumping back to those early slides, what is the one qualification to be worthy to receive the Lord's Supper? Examine yourself. You think Barry can examine himself. Maybe. Maybe it's not a bad answer. Pastor Frank usually takes it day by day when he goes to visit Barry. And he asks Barry, and if the answer comes back complete nonsense, he doesn't commute. If Barry is right with it, and you would be amazed at how many people become lucid when you talk about your, your Savior. And then Pastor Frank does to me. It's, it's hard sometimes, because Pastor Frank wants to offer that comfort. And the Lord's Supper is powerful, and it goes, there's awesome promises that God attaches to it. And yet, we try to be careful for the reasons we already said. 
7, Barb was visiting Star of Jerusalem Lutheran Church for the first time. She heard Pastor Frank's explanation of closed communion following his sermon. You're sitting next to her. She tells you that she was offended that he was just judging her faith. What do you say? First of all, have you, has that ever happened to any of you? I've never asked you that. Because I've been doing that for a few years now. I want to say, man, five probably after the sermon explanation. Not seeing anyone. I guess it's never happened. Did you? Did they say that? Oh, okay, that's a different one, but yeah, that's a question about it. Did you answer? Or did they like it? Oh, well. That's okay. That's okay, because not, I, you have no... Uh, just be honest. That's all anyone really ever wants is honesty. Okay? And uh, if they don't like it, so be it. Okay? Yeah. And you, if you're not comfortable explaining, you can A, tell them, you know what, why don't we talk to the pastor? Or B, I guess you could study a little more. But don't freeze up. I mean, just be honest with them. Okay? Eight. Bell is five. She has watched her parents and the rest of the church go up to the Lord's Supper. When the adults go back to their seats, they look sad to Bell. She asks you boldly and directly, how do you feel after you go to the Lord's Supper? What do you say? What do our kids see, I guess, is what I want to get to. Okay. Yeah. Well, otherwise I have a thought too in the next slide about it, but. The sacrament is pure gospel. Jesus was given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin. Usually the reaction I see is that, really. And people are curious when they come. Say these words with me. Soul, adorn yourself with gladness. Leave behind all gloom and sadness. Come into the daylight splendor. There with joy your praises render. Now I kneel before you lowly. Filled with joy most deep and holy, as with trembling awe and wonder, on your mighty work. This is the last slide. The only thing that I said I'd explain that I haven't is when somebody comes up who I don't know who they are. I do have colleagues who say that they do not feel comfortable, and they say the risk is too great to commune them because they're worried about the harm done to their souls, so they do pass them by, but they don't know who they are. I, there's, we, there's, we don't know. And they're not wrong. I have said, lose the battle to win the war, I guess. And I will commune them. And it has happened only twice where they would take the bread, but they wouldn't take the wine. You're going to hear next week that there's some convoluted logic behind that. But I, I, I think if someone came to the front of church and, and I passed them by, there's a chance they'd be so embarrassed they'd never hear anything that I ever had to say again. To them. And so I commune them, not knowing what's going to happen, just to be able to talk to them afterwards. So that's my reasoning behind it. It's kind of something that we, we talk about a lot because this does bother us as clergy. But what we do want you guys to feel is comfortable, number one, with the sacrament. Number two, that is really good. And to do invite your friends and not be afraid of it. Any comment or reaction on that point? If not, that was the question last week, and that's the answer. The sink is called the piscina, and the drain that goes straight into the ground is called the aquarium. Somebody asked, what do we do with the elements? And uh, that is what some churches do. I don't know. At least thought that it did go into the ground. Ed thought not. What does Ed know, right? <laughs> I, 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 it, <clears throat> we're we're going to talk about next week about what do you do with all that because that's a big deal in different faith. That's fine. At this time... <laughs>